they don't want what we know out there. How a person can go from really almost nothing to becoming a millionaire by owning rental properties. He would always buy these flip houses, and I just remember thinking, this guy is crazy. Why would he buy that house? In the past decade, there's been a huge surge in the peer-to-peer short-term rental market. Become an insider. So you have to know the rules before you get the game. Every second counts. So make every second count. Welcome to the Real Estate Jam. Whether you're just beginning or the best of the best, we're glad you're here. We will share successes, failures, and strategies for the action-taking real estate investor. And now to your hosts, JD and Melissa. Welcome to the Real Estate Jam podcast. I'm JD with my wonderful and busy co host, <laughs> Melissa. Hey, how are you, JD? I'm doing great. How are you? Super good. Happy All Monday. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, we got a, a, a great show uh, today, uh, and, and I'm sure it's going to be phenomenal. We got uh, Sandia Sasha. <laughs> I'm sorry, Sasadri. <laughs> Uh, we practiced it six times before we started recording, and then I just messed it up. Uh, Sandia, I'm super sorry for messing that up. Uh, Sandia okay. is, is the uh, owner and leader of Multifamily for You. She syndicates deals, buys um, 100 plus unit uh, apartment complexes, uh, um, and currently has. $80 million under uh, assets under management. Wow. And uh, she's done all of that in about three years. Um, she's a super smart engineering background, run this, uh, ran uh, circles around other people in the stock market, and then decided that real estate investing was the, the next chapter of her life. Sandia, we're, we're super happy to have you here today. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Um, really appreciate it. Um, yes, I have an engineering background and my company was kind enough to send me to get an MBA. So that's where I got my financial knowledge. But once I had children, et cetera, my lifestyle became a bigger deal. And so I didn't want to be in the corporate rat race. And that's when I went full time into the stock market. But then for the tax advantages is what brought me to real estate. And I didn't grow up with a background to be a handy person. So if someone called me at Thanksgiving dinner to fix a leaky toilet, you know, that's not my cup of tea. So and I didn't really see a lot of margins and just having single family rental properties. But when I heard from a weekend seminar about multifamily, it really made sense. I attended Brad Sumrock's program and, uh, you know, we started right away buying large multifamily because you have the connections, the network and the teams to help you get there. So I cannot imagine just looking at an apartment down the street and saying, oh, an ordinary person like me could just go buy it. But that's what happens because multifamily is a team sport. So I got the education through a mentoring program, and that's where I met my future partners. And they had the experience that I did not have. So I was sort of like your intern or worker bee, and they would put me to work, and I'd go do the work, and I learned on the job. So my first deal, I didn't make a huge amount of money. But it was all about learning and getting networked and having brokers and everyone know me as a local syndicator. And then after that, I had the confidence to do more on my own. And so every deal, I still partner with at least one or two other partners so that we can cover all bases with complementary strengths. Like one of my partners has worked in the insurance industry. Another one is an accountant, et cetera. And then I'm the engineering background. I'm analytical. I'm also local to the Dallas area. I've lived here for over 31 years. So I know my neighborhoods really well. And I know how much uh, Dallas has changed over the last three decades in terms of, you know, places that were empty fields are now big cities, et cetera. So that's another thing that I can offer. So whenever someone asks me, how do you get in from zero background to a large multifamily? I think the biggest thing is to realize that it's who, not how, which is one of my favorite books, by the way, you got to find the people who are already doing what you want to be doing. And you want to go figure out how you can be useful to them find something they don't like to do and you make sure you can do that for them. And that's how you find your partners. And then you learn everything you possibly can, right? Be eager, be thirsty, volunteer to do everything. Don't say this is my job and that's your job. You know, just, just sign up to do everything and learn everything. And that's what I did. So I learned all the aspects of it, right. From, you know, finding deals, underwriting deals, uh, you know, 
studying the market, do analyzing your comps, which is your comparative properties nearby, so that you can say, oh, a two bedroom here rents for this much compared to what's within a one mile radius. So all of that analysis, I learned that. And then it's a matter of raising money, right? That's the hardest part also. If you don't have the experience, if you haven't done it before and you're a first timer, how do you go raise money? That's when you leverage the resume of your partners and you say, these partners of mine have done this over and over many times. They'll be the real brains running this operation, but I'll be the boots on the ground. I'll be the one to do the work. So combined as a team, you've got this many years of experience. And so when you put together a webinar, you leverage the resumes of the experienced people and that helps you raise the money. And then in asset management, for example, that's where my partners, again, directed a lot of stuff, but my first deal, the partners were out of state. So I was the one showing up to the properties, talking to the vendors and learning a lot by being there. And that's how our first deal was very successful. We just sold it a couple of months ago with like a 3X kind of return in 26 months despite COVID. So I'm completely sold on this multifamily. If you've got the education and you know your markets and you partner with the right people, this can be a very successful venture. Yeah, I think it is. I And that's a, a lot to unpack. But mm -hmm. one of the things that you mentioned is your first deal, you, when you started out, you, you, you weren't making a ton of money on, on that first deal. Did you come in as a limited partner or, or was your first deal as a general partner? Um, I've done both. But I'm, when I said my first deal, I'm talking about my first deal as a general partner. Okay. I did do some deals as a limited partner using my retirement funds because those are things I could not use in my own deal. And I wanted to leave them as retirement funds for my corporate times. Um, but then my first deal as a general partner also, I didn't make a whole lot of money because I wanted to partner with people who had much more experience than me. And that's part of the deal. It's, it's like you get paid like an intern, but you know, you learn so much from it. So I needed that. I needed that before I could raise money. Like my neighbors and friends invested in the first deal. And I didn't want to do it on my own with other inexperienced sure. people and take a chance when it involves other people's money. That was very important to me. Right. I can, I completely mm -hmm. understand that. So a lot of the, a lot of the people that we bring on the show that talk about syndication, uh, they, they, try to find partners that have different skills than they do. Mm -hmm. But what I'm really curious about with you is like, what is the the thing that you have that you're better at than other people that, that makes you valuable to these other partners? What do you bring to your, th these people that you've partnered with? So the first deal, it was boots on the ground, knowledge of the market, available to do anything local. So whether it's talking to the broker, showing up anytime a vendor is uh, showing up to the property, doing all those surprise visits to the property, any kind of comp analysis, all of that. So anything you need to be done locally, I was your person. And I was also good in analysis. So underwriting is my strength. I love spreadsheets. So that's also one of my strengths with my strong math and engineering background. So I would say that those were the things I brought to the table in my first deal. Now I'm like, uh, this is going to be my sixth deal this year. And so all of these most recent deals, I've raised over $5 million in capital. So I can also bring capital to the table. And I also am better at asset management today, having gone through five deals <laughs> than at my very first deal. So I do all aspects of multifamily, but the primary reason I partner with others is definitely to find partners who've got a different background than me. So if someone's an accountant or has insurance experience, experience with contracts, those are all things that I look for because I bring the analytics, the underwriting, the comp analysis, the local market knowledge, some level of capital raising, as well as boots on the ground asset management, because I tend to do my deals all in Dallas, Fort Worth, which is where I'm based. Okay. What I'm really interested in, I think, is the acquisitions process. Uh, how are you guys finding these deals, identifying that it's even something that's in your buy box, and then and then later on maybe how, how you actually break down the analysis of, of the property? But starting out, how are you finding these deals, and, and what does that look like for you guys? So one basic criteria for any deal is it's got to pass my neighborhood, crime, uh, that kind of a check. So I have a Neil Bauer analysis I use, and that basically talks about the crime stats, median household income. Uh, I, I like the schools, the proximity to schools, proximity to employers, 
uh, et cetera. So I drive by a property by day as well as by night to check for safety. That's very important to me. As far as finding the deals itself, now that I've been in this business for three years, I've been a limited as well as general partner in multiple deals. Some of it is word of mouth. I know that a deal is going to be sold in three months, even before it gets listed. So I've already done all my background work on it. So I'm ready to pounce the minute they're ready to list it so that I can sometimes do a preemptive offer and get it before it goes into a bidding war. Sure. But I'm also connected with all the major brokers in the area. So of course, all of their listings, all of their mailing lists, I see it. So my quick criteria is usually location first, because that's an easy one. Certainly number of doors, the vintage of the property, the amount of value I can bring to it. Like, is it already close to market rents? What can we do? What other meat is left on the bone for me to pursue it? And so from an underwriting standpoint, in a five years, I want to be able to get to 80 to 100% return for my investors. Mm -hmm. So if I plug a few basic things into the analysis spreadsheet that I have, um, it's pretty easy to figure out within a matter of, you know, 20, 30 minutes if it's worth pursuing any further. So one of the most important things is what is my entry cap at the time that I purchase the property? What's going to be the cap rate when the property is stabilized? And then at what cap rate I'm going to sell it? Because I always assume market conditions to be worse in a few years when I sell it than what it is today, because that makes the underwriting conservative. So I assume an exit cap rate or the cap rate at the time that I'm going to sell the property to be higher than at the time that I purchase it to get into a couple of specifics in my underwriting. Mm -hmm. And what level of, of value add are you guys considering? Are, are you adding additional units? Are you updating facilities, adding a dog park? What, what kind of things are you doing that, that increase the rent or force that appreciation on these deals that you're uh, buying, buying with partners and, and uh, selling for hopefully more at the end? So Interior upgrades is always a good one. It's always something lenders like to loan you money for. So I like to see things that I can value add for which lenders see it as a positive and they're willing to loan you the money and therefore see the upside. I look for properties where the rents are well below the comp properties nearby. Meaning if you compare my 80s property to another you know, 2000 something vintage property, that's not a fair comparison. Right. So apples to apples comparison of that area, making sure the rents are the same. I do have one deal, very recent deal that we closed where we're going to add additional new units. And so that's a definitely always a plus. That's always an upside to increase your unit count. But basic interior upgrades usually can get you the rent bumps you need. Amenities that residents actually appreciate, like offering Wi-Fi, um, adding washer dryer or installing washer dryer units inside the units is very, very valuable when it's uh, families. So again, I look at the unit types you have versus the demographic. Are we near schools? Are we looking at families? Do we have more of the two and three bedrooms versus are we in a more industrial park? Uh, the one bedrooms are okay, et cetera. So accordingly, depending on who your client is or your avatar, as you call it, your resident, um, you want to make sure the amenities match that tenant profile so that there is always a value add component left in it. I cannot do just a pure yield play. Gotcha. That, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So uh, how are you finding your investors? The investors find me through, you know, hosts like you put me in webinars, but also friend of friends. The first time I had a deal and now we've completed a full cycle. Now those are raving fans of us because we ended up doing so well in that particular deal. Some of which is certainly the cap rate compression, but a lot of it is careful asset management through COVID, right? When others have delinquency issues, we hardly had any. So I think that once you have one success story and that spreads out, certainly social media helps, LinkedIn helps, but you have to have that personal connection and those three touches because I tend to do 506B like Bravo deals. Mm -hmm. So I can't just meet somebody once at a conference, exchange business cards out, and start sending my deals to them. So referral is again, still the best, the old fashioned referral way. So when an existing resident, you know, existing uh, investor is very happy with the deal and they refer me three more people, that really helps a lot. So it's a slow process, but um, you know, once you find the right people and they you know, become your raving fans, then each of them you know, times three, times four, times five gets you more uh, investors. And really, if you think about it, it's 50 investors uh, times you know, $50,000 each is $2.5 million. So you know, that's how you add up. Right. 
and I, I, I'm sure we, we can't talk any specific deals or potential deals, but if we were going to do a hypothetical deal, well, what are you looking at for the investment from them? And then what, what would in, uh, investors expect in a return or what kind of ter- return um, are, are they looking to get hypothetically? So hypothetically, we always project, and I can talk about my past deals for which I'm no longer raising money, but like a $50,000 investment, we tell them that typically it's 80 to 100% return in five years. So 50K could become 50K plus another 50K in five years, or maybe 50 plus another 30 to 40K in five years. And so that includes return of their principal plus the extra money. In terms of distributions in the past, my average has been anywhere in the range of 7 to 9%, but the first deal ended up actually doing more than 10%, and I don't want to say that as a projection for any future deals. Uh, because of inflation and other factors, we want to be more, um, shall we say, under-promise and over-deliver. I would say the average cash flow, if cash flow is important to you, uh, the cash flow on these deals average tends to be the first year is usually the least because we're stabilizing the property and you know adding all of our value add components to it. So it takes about six months to stabilize. So in the first 12 months, you may only get five or 6% in cash flow, but after that, it goes up. It goes up to 8%, 10%, and so on. So your average is somewhere between eight and 9%, let's say in five years, plus your principal back. That's the typical projections we have on our deals. And uh, the minimum investment tends to be $50,000, but always preference is given to people with higher investment amounts. Also, we don't take a disposition fee. We don't take a refinancing fee if we do that. We do uh, now take an acquisition fee in the range of half to 1%. It's not like a three, 4% kind of really huge fees. And the biggest thing I look for is one of the things I develop is a, a sponsorship checklist. So if you're considering investing with a sponsor and you'd like to get a hold of my checklist, you can visit my website and ask for it. But one thing I want to see is I want to see every sponsor in the deal. That, that means every general partner in the deal have some money left in the deal after it closes and after they take their acquisition fee, I still want them to have some money in the deal. That's important for me because I still occasionally invest as a limited partner and I want to make sure the sponsor has their money in the deal to work hard on the deal after closing. Because a lot of people celebrate the closing like a big wedding, you know, and then nobody talks about what happens after the honeymoon is over, right? So this is the phase, the asset management phase that makes the difference between, you know, providing a return or not providing a return to your investors. So um, definitely I look for people who stay with the deal, who can discuss their deal afterwards. So my investors can always call me directly and I can tell them, okay, this particular property A has five vacancies right now out of 116 and two of them are already pre-leased with move-ins next week. So I can give you that level of detail on my properties. And so I'm very much a hands-on asset manager as well. So that's what you can expect. Monthly reports, obviously, um, first six months, depending on the deal, you may get a distribution in three months or six months. Uh, but after that, it'll be every quarter. And sometimes we go to monthly if the property is cash flowing really well. Uh, one thing that happened to us in 2021 is we had a big snowstorm during COVID. We call it the, the snowvid, you know. <laughs> and at that time, if you have 20 units down with burst pipes, et cetera, that happened to some of my um, friends in the business, you want to be capitalized. You want to hold on to cash so that you can do the repairs immediately and turn in receipts to insurance instead of waiting on insurance money before you even repair these down units, because then you're not collecting revenue. So right before the winter, which is right now, like January, February kind of timeframes, I don't make huge distributions for that reason. And I tell my investors, wait till May, guys, and I'll give it all to you, like what I promised, because right now I want to hold on to cash in case we have burst pipes or something. Uh, in the next uh, 30 days. No, well, that, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's super clear to me, and I'm sure it's, it's clear to everybody else that, that you've come a long way from uh, the girl carrying a, a, a couple of suitcases to a girl uh-huh. with, uh, with 80,000 or $80 million uh, worth of assets under management. Uh, and you had mentioned that you, you used the the mentorship program, and you went to a seminar, went through through the mentorship mm-hmm. program. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think there's there's always two different sides, right? There's there's people who are for paid men- mentorship and people who are adamantly ag- against it. Can you kind of maybe break down uh, your thoughts on that? And and obviously, uh, 
your mentorship, whether it was paid or not, was a benefit and, and has, has helped you find success. But do you think that's a product of, of the, the paid mentorship or is that you're a successful person, you have this success mindset and you are going to be successful regardless, you just needed a push in the right direction? Um, for me, the purpose of a mentorship, and this is what I recommend to anyone else, is write out your goals. These are my five goals, which is in 12 months, I want to syndicate at least one property that's worth this much of this size in this neighborhood, right? Be as specific and measurable as you can. Then having written out this goal, then go talk to people in this mentorship program to say, is this a realistic goal? And do you think this membership uh, mentorship program is going to get me there? So I had a goal within the first 12 months, I wanted to syndicate at least one property of 60 plus doors in the Dallas Fort Worth area. And when I attended the weekend seminar, it seemed like it was a really good mentorship focused on my market, right? That's important because everybody I met, at least half of them already had properties right there in Dallas. So they were doing what I wanted to be doing. So that's very important. And the program definitely uh, paid off for me in a big way because Yes, they had the education, knowledge, and network. And when you pay for a mentorship program, it's like a country club membership. You're basically getting, you know, new doors are being opened to you. But it's up to you to go inside that country club, make those connections, and make it what you want it to be. If you're just going to be sitting in a corner and hardly visiting the club, then it's not the same effect. The second thing is being very clear about what you have to offer to an experienced sponsor. Like I came with zero real estate background, right? And I wanted to see results quickly. I, if I took the time to study everything on my own freely from podcasts and books, et cetera, it would have taken me a lot longer to achieve the same results for me. Now, somebody else might have grown up already with a dad who does fixing up of houses, flipping and all of that already in the real estate business already knows the people and connections and they know the market well, et cetera, then their barriers to entry might be a lot less. They may not benefit quite as much from a mentoring program. The other thing I find is a lot of people have full-time corporate jobs and think that because they paid a mentorship program, there's big bucks, they could just go get a deal. And that's not true, right? You have to put in the time, the energy, the effort to do it. So I think it's a little of all, but the fundamentals is write out your goals, see if a mentorship program can get you there by talking to people already in it, and then figure out what you have to offer to an experienced sponsor if you lack the experience to figure out if that's a fit. Yeah, I think that's that's a really good way for somebody who is looking into or interested in starting uh, syndications, uh, which we run pe- across people mm-hmm. all the time uh, that are. Um, if somebody's listening right now and, and they want to find out more about you or more about your story and, and what you guys kind of have to to offer over there, uh, where should we send them? My website is the best place to find me. It's multifamilyforyou.com, where it's multifamily number four, Y-O-U.com. They can put their name, email address, and send me a note, and uh, we can connect from there. I'm also on LinkedIn as well as Facebook, so I'm active on both those platforms uh, if you want to connect with me there. Okay. And I can provide a checklist to vet a sponsorship team if you're considering investing with someone in multifamily and you don't know what questions to ask to see if it meets your risk tolerance profile. That's a good way to start. I love that. That's that's, awesome. That's great. Mm -hmm. Um, Sandia, thank you so much for for coming on the podcast today. I'm sorry we had a little bit of trouble this morning, (laughs) but we got it all worked out. And uh, I'm I'm grateful that you were able to provide Mm -hmm. so much value to us today. Oh, no, we can't see it. Oh, there he goes. Do it again. Uh-oh. What is it doing? I didn't know if you wanted to know about a favorite book, but Atomic Habits is one of my favorite books. Awesome. Atomic yeah. Habits. Who's the author? Um, it's by James Clear. Okay. Very oh, cool. Oh, there it is. All Atomic right. Habits. Got it. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate Have you. a good day. You too. Bye. Thank you for listening to The Real Estate Jam. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. For more information, check out our website, therealestatejam.com, or find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at The Real Estate Jam. If you have any questions, feel free to drop us an email at therealestatejam at gmail.com. See you next episode.